Audio recording for this meeting has begun. Hello, everyone. On behalf of AgriLinks, Feed the Future, and the USAID Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, I would like to welcome you to today's webinar on women's empowerment in beyond production activities. Today, our presenters are going to share findings from a landscape analysis that examines women's empowerment in activities like marketing, processing, retail, and others. My name is Julie McCarty, and I am your AgriLinks webinar host today with the USAID Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. And I'll be keeping an eye on everything, and you may hear my voice pop in here and there during the event or the Q&A session. Before we dive into the content, I'd like to go over a few of the usual items to orient you to the webinar. First, please do use the chat box to introduce yourselves, to ask questions, and to share resources. As you know, for those who are our regular attendees, we love for our AgriLinks webinars to be as interactive as possible. We'll be collecting your questions throughout the webinar, and we will answer as many as we can either in the chat box along the way or during the verbal Q&A session. So please post your questions at any time. Don't hold back. You'll see that the slides are available for download in the box on the bottom left of your screen. And there's also a links box that points to some of the resources that we'll be talking about today. We also have a link to our closed captions for the webinar for, for anyone who may benefit from having live captioning. So that link is in the links box, but we'll also post it um, periodically in the chat box to make sure that you have access. Lastly, we are recording this webinar and we will email you the recording, the transcript, and any additional resources once they are ready. They'll also be posted on the AgriLinks event page for this webinar. Okay, I am going to go ahead and introduce my fellow facilitator, Jamie Holbrook, who will provide an introduction to our other speakers and an overview of today's agenda. So Jamie is the Knowledge Management Coordinator for the Feed the Future Advancing Women's Empowerment Program, which is led by Encompass, where she leads knowledge capture and dissemination of AWE's learning products. And so I'd love to go ahead and pass the mic over to Jamie. Thank you so much, Julie, and hello to everyone who is here. We are delighted that you could join us today. Uh, on behalf of the whole AWE team, um, we're really excited to share some of our findings and best practices on women's empowerment and beyond production activities with you today. So I would like to start us off by uh, introducing the presenters that we'll have today and going through the agenda for today's webinar. Uh, first up, we'll hear from Asla Kess, who is the Senior Gender Advisor at the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. Uh, she is uh, working on gender issues in agricultural and rural development, most recently with a focus on women's off-farm em uh, employment and entrepreneurship, financial inclusion, and solutions to unpaid care. She is also AWE COR. And she will be giving us some background on our program and on the research that we'll be presenting today and AWE's work past, present, and future. Uh, next up, we will hear from Melissa Matlock, who will give us an overview of approaches to empowering women in beyond production. Melissa is Associate Director of Gender and Social Inclusion at ACDI VOCA. She conducts research and develops strategies to integrate women and youth empowerment into projects and proposals there. And actually, after that, we'll be hearing from Jennifer Himmelstein. Um, she'll be taking us into a deep dive into collecting and using data to understand and implement good practices for empowering women in beyond production activities. She's the Director of Corporate Analysis and Technical Assurance at ACDI VOCA. Um, she provides technical oversight of monitoring and evaluation processes across ACDI VOCA's global portfolio. And last but not least, Jen Williamson will be leading us through the Q&A portion of today's webinar, and we look forward to your questions. Uh, Jen is the Vice President of Gender and Social Inclusion at ACDI VOCA. Um, she leads a team uh, implementing ACDI VOCA's organizational policy, strategy, guidelines, and resources to promote gender equality and inclusion of marginalized groups. Uh, Jen is also the Gender and Agriculture Systems Advisor for the AWE program. So with that, 
And I do believe I will hand it over to Asla to give us an overview of AWE and the research we'll be looking at today. Uh, thank you, Jamie. It, and thanks everyone for joining us this morning. Uh, as Jamie noted, I will start us this morning with a brief introduction to advancing women's empowerment in agriculture or the R mechanism. Uh, and uh, I will actually dive deeper in, into the mechanisms, sort of services, and, and, and uh, support at the end of the event. Uh, but for now, I wanted to mention that uh, all launched in 2018, going into its third year, is a program dedicated to advance the state of evidence and practice around gender equality and women's empowerment in agriculture through research, tool development, and technical assistance to missions and implementing partners. The research we will hear about today aims to increase our understanding of the nature, scope, and scale of women's empowerment in beyond production interventions, so uh, empowering women in their roles across food and agriculture systems as service providers, processors, traders, retailers, and so forth, and also how, to, uh, how the outcomes of these interventions are monitored, analyzed, and reported. Uh, the research looked mainly uh, at uh, recent and ongoing Feed the Future activities that uh, uh, are taking place or took place across uh, various contexts, uh, about 20 in total, uh, that had a beyond production component. Uh, and I will turn the mic now to Melissa, who will speak uh, and tell us more about the research, the methodology, and the findings. Thank you. Thank you, Asla. So to give a little bit of background on the research, the Beyond Production Landscape Analysis actually builds on a similar landscape analysis that was published in 2016 under the Leveraging Economic Opportunities Project. Um, that research consolidated existing data regarding when women's economic empowerment and Feed the Future non-production interventions and also identified areas where further research is needed. For our analysis, we had three key learning questions that guided our initial research. Um, the first was, are Feed the Future efforts in beyond production activities affecting women's empowerment? How are the efforts in beyond production affecting women's empowerment? And then what are the opportunities and practices to increase both women's participation and returns from higher value activities, either in agribusiness or employment? The methodology for the research was actually consists of two phases, the first being a landscape analysis and the second is an impact assessment. So the landscape analysis was conducted by a team of two researchers, which included Michelle Stern, who served as the lead researcher, and I also supported as a research specialist. We selected 20 projects through consultation with USAID based on select criteria, such as it was a Feed the Future donor-funded program, it was ongoing or ended in the last past five years, et cetera. We ended up with a wide geographic range of projects, including nine from Sub-Saharan Africa, two in Asia, and three multi-country projects. We conducted a desk review of annual and quarterly reports, gender analyses, gender strategies, um, value chain analyses, MEL plans, evaluations, and other discrete studies for each of the 20 projects. We then selected four projects to conduct key informant interviews with to build on and confirm what we learned during the document review phase, as well as explore more in depth the approaches, the challenges the projects had, if and how they applied data, and what other support would be required for improved implementation. So some of the limitations that we found in the landscape analysis phase that many times there were information gaps, um, reporting was not standardized, uh, the indicators and data related to beyond production were oftentimes applied inconsistently, so not disaggregated by sex or not disaggregated by value chain actor type, um, which made it difficult to, to evaluate results. And also while we sought to identify approaches that engaged, benefited, and empowered women, what we found was that oftentimes projects would report participation, but there was a lack of corresponding data around the benefits or empowerment. So it was difficult to draw conclusions beyond engagement levels. 
for the next phase of the research, which is the impact assessment. This will be led by um, market share associates. And based on the landscape analysis findings and discussions with USAID, they have selected one project to assess beyond production strategies and outcomes using qualitative and exploratory methodologies. The assessment is ongoing and um, the results will be shared once they are finalized. So when we talk about beyond production, what does that mean exactly? For our purposes, we divided the interventions into seven different beyond production categories. Um, as you can see here, that includes inputs development, service provision, post-harvest handling, processing, marketing, business development, and access to finance. Across those interventions, we found common approaches that includes training, organizational strengthening, like business development or coaching, linkages to different value chain actors or networks, um, access to technology and infrastructure, information systems, and setting standards or certification. So now onto the more interesting parts, the findings. Um, our findings are divided into two sections, which includes implementation and monitoring, evaluation, and learning. This first finding really looks at projects beyond production interventions in general without a gender lens necessarily to identify where the projects are intervening in beyond production and what are those activities. We found that some projects had broad scopes while others worked exclusively in beyond production. More than half of the projects re reviewed worked exclusively in beyond production activities, um, such as inputs or investment facilitation, while there were eight projects that supported both production and beyond production related activities. Projects carried out um, beyond production interventions at all areas of the value chain. If you look at the chart, um, business development was the most common area, which projects intervened, followed by marketing, and then access to finance. Many projects intervened at multiple levels, and there were five projects that were reported intervening across all seven categories. Within each um, area, projects conducted a wide range of approaches. Training was the most common activity across all the value chain areas, followed by facilitating linkages. This was especially common in service provision, input, and processing levels. Um, and then information systems was the least common approach used. The projects that we reviewed, a majority developed gender mainstreaming strategies to guide um, their beyond production activities. Of the 20 projects, 12 had gender strategies and 10 of those included specific beyond production interventions. Projects use different approaches. Um, many used a gender integration approach, mainstreaming gender concerns across all of their activities, while others designed specific targeted activities because they weren't able to reach women through their standard planned activities or they found women were not in a position to benefit from the activities. One example of this is that the agricultural value chain project in Bangladesh supported the creation of a separate women's vegetable market when they realized women were not able to safely market their produce at a traditional market. We also found that some projects carried out gender mainstreaming or targeted beyond production activities without having a set gender strategy. So the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Processing and Post-Harvest Handling carried out studies to learn about gender-related opportunities and constraints, and they also implemented several activities to engage women in processing. Further findings, um, projects implemented a wide range of beyond production activities to support and engage women. We found that business development was the most common intervention, followed by marketing and access to finance. Um, 17 of the 20 projects used gender integration approaches to promote equitable participation of women, and 12 of the 20 projects put in place beyond production activities specifically targeted at women. Of those targeted approaches, the most common was to provide additional or customized trainings to women's groups, um, women entrepreneurs, business owners, or other value chain actors. Other targeted approaches included linking to finance or using champion or mentorship models to build the skills of women. We found that there were various factors that influenced how projects supported women and beyond production work. So one example of that was the scope of the project. 
Um, gender integration and USAID flagship projects often appear to focus on women farmers. So facilitating access to services or information to increase their production efficiency, which meant that other nodes or areas of the value chain was not necessarily a priority for that project. The methodology of the project also, or the overall approach, also affected how projects supported women and beyond production. So more traditional value chain, value chain type approaches, um, those projects could intervene directly to target and support women in beyond production roles. Whereas uh, market systems programs due to their more facilitative nature tended to focus on the business case to influence actors to engage women in their various roles. However, it was difficult to discern the effectiveness of that type of approach. With um, beyond production, projects often adapted their activities to seek ways to increase women's participation. Oftentimes they made adaptations due to um, gender constraints such as lack of information, um, lack of assets, limited mobility, or cultural context. Some of those common adaptations included using role models or mentorship models. 25% um, of the projects brought successful women forward to mentor other women or use them, dem demonstrate their success as a role model. Projects also used groups, both mixed groups and women's groups to increase women's participation. There were a few projects that also used groups to enhance women's leadership. So, Natal and Bay in Senegal used a gender champion strategy with their consolidation network or producer network to increase the engagement of women in their target serial value chains. And as part of that strategy, they engaged men to support women's initiatives and also introduced participatory diagnostic sessions um, with the networks to reflect on the women's positions in those networks, as well as identify problems and solutions that could help facilitate women's integration into decision-making bodies. We looked at employment, but in general, there was a lack of information related to women's employment. Many projects use business development or investment facilitation, facilitation strategies to strengthen agribusinesses, um, increase their sales and employment, and projects mainstream gender equity and targeted women through these approaches. Um, and some, but not all of those um, projects tracked the resulting jobs or employment. We did not find any further um, information on the impacts of the employment though. And finally, there were some projects that worked on the enabling environment, but it was pretty minimal. These projects worked mostly around increasing women's participation in the policy process, such as including them in public private dialogues. There was only one project we found that supported targeted um, enabling environment changes. And this was the Confish, Confish Plus um, projects in Senegal, which facilitated a national declaration on women in fisheries. And they also developed a fishery sector capacity, capacity building strategy for women and action plan, which was signed and adopted by the Department of Maritime Fisheries. When looking at finance, many projects adapted their approaches to enable women to access credit, to invest in their beyond production livelihoods. Um, many projects focused on linking women's groups to MFIs, or they would establish village savings and loan associations if women were not able to access formal loans. Um, VSLAs did help women access smaller amounts of credit. Women that were linked to formal finances financial institutions, um, projects tended to work through women's groups rather than individual women in order to provide more security to the financial service providers. Um, one example is that um, the Financing Ghanaian Agricultural Project intentionally hired female business development service providers, which supported the aggregation of women's financing applications to ease collateral requirements, reduce the transaction costs for banks, and increase the likelihood of loan approvals. And finally, looking at youth, we saw that beyond production approaches that targeted youth were able to achieve gender balance and integrated interventions. There were a number of projects that targeted youth and beyond production. Um, the most common approaches were linking university students or recent graduates to the private sector through internships or in entry level jobs. And within these interventions, most of them were small or um, 
pilots uh, projects, and they were able to reach 50% of young women or more. Moving on to the MEL findings, um, first we saw that beyond production indicators rarely captured uh, gender differentiated impact data. So many projects use standard feed the future indicators and while production indicators were generally sex disaggregated, beyond production indicators were not. Um, feed the future does provide information on required disaggregation, but we found that reporting was mixed. Many projects disaggregated by value chain actor, but not by sex or vice versa. So it was hard to understand the impacts on women and beyond production. Um, one good example we found was the agriculture diversification activity in Mal Malawi did disaggregate um, the indicator of value of agricultural and rural loans as a result of US government assistance by sex for producers, local traders, um, wholesalers, processors, and others. Um, a second finding was that few projects use targeted indicators to measure their progress or impacts of gender specific or women's empowerment focused beyond production work. Of the 20 projects we reviewed, only seven use gender specific beyond production indicators. Most only had one, there are a couple that had multiple. So one example of this would be um, one project had the indicator of value of new private sector investment targeting women and youth owned businesses. And finally, for um, the WEA, the Women's Empowerment Agriculture Index, um, this was really designed to focus on agriculture production and was not found to be effective for measuring beyond production. We did see that um, the WEA was used by at least eight projects, either the full survey or the framework in some of the domains. Um, many projects did attempt to make ad adaptations to the WEA, um, one project specifically adapted um, decision-making and production for business decision-making. Um, however, through the KIIs um, with chiefs of party and gender specialists, they commented the way it was not appropriate for the beyond production and it was also not found to be useful for the market systems context as well. So recommendations around implementation, the first recommendation was to carry out further beyond production learning research. So additional studies are going to be important to continue to develop the evidence base. Um, implementing partners should be supported to conduct and share impact assessments, learning studies um, from individual projects to evaluate the participation, benefit, and empowerment impacts of beyond production interventions. Um, another recommendation was to provide missions um, and implementing partners with guidance on engaging women in beyond production interventions. So many IPs have taken on lessons around engaging women more meaningfully in, in production related activities and USA could follow a similar strategy to encourage IPs to do the same around beyond production activities, um, including developing tools and resources to support IPs in their project design and implementation. Around MEL, the first recommendation was asking partners to set ambitious yet realistic targets. Um, this includes ensuring that the gender analysis looks at women's constraints and opportunities in beyond production roles, and then setting targets accordingly uh, with those um, gender analysis findings. The second was to require IPs to disaggregate beyond production indicators. Um, as we mentioned, looking at disaggregations that include sex disaggregation as well as value chain actor role is important. And finally, determining an effective strategy to measure women's empowerment. Um, so looking at the WEA in its original format, it wasn't intended to be used for beyond production activities. So looking at adaptations or other tools um, that may be required. Um, so those are the findings and recommendations from the report. Obviously, there's much more detailed information in the full report, um, which I would encourage everyone to review. Um, but for now, I'm going to pass it on to my colleague, Jennifer Himmelstein, to talk more about collecting and using beyond production data for women's empowerment. Thanks so much, Melissa. Okay, great. Yeah, I'm going to talk about some strategies for 
collecting and using data for promoting women's economic empowerment in beyond production activities, and specifically monitoring and evaluation strategies. So many projects start with um, creating something called a theory of change at the beginning of their project. And a uh, theory of change is basically a, it's a model of how a project predicts they will achieve change in the systems that they are working in. And a theory of, of change is depicted through a series of interconnected causal pathways and outcomes. And by intentionally integrating beyond production causal pathways and outcomes into your theory of change, this specifically for females and males, because sometimes it can be different for both, um, this will help ensure that there are monitoring and evaluation indicators and learning questions that are connected to these specific causal pathways and outcomes. And if you want to learn more about uh, creating a monitoring and evaluation system based on a theory of change, please refer to <clears throat> this document that we have linked here, and we have a link to it in our resources in the, in, in the, the website here, so please check it out. I'd also like to recommend a different monitoring evaluation strategy, which is review your data collection forms for your monitoring evaluation system, taking a beyond production lens. So I would really prioritize looking at, if you, if you had to prioritize, your, your registration forms for your individuals, as well as your registration forms for your organizations, because these forms are connected to to most of your indicators that you're collecting for m and &E and are a crucial part of the database that your monitoring and evaluation team has. So when you look at that individual, individual registration form, check and see if there's a field that for uh, sex identification. Does it, does it, is there an option for choosing whether or not this individual is a female or male or other? Is there another field uh, for identifying what kind of what kind of actor this individual is. Are they a producer or are they an extension agent? Do they play another role? Do the same thing with your organization registration form. See if there's a field to for the organization to identify whether or not it's female-owned, male-owned, mixed-sex owned, or some other type of field if maybe that this this organization is is run by a board. And again, check if there is a field for identifying the, the type of organization uh, that this is. Are they a producer organization? Are they maybe some kind of processor in the private sector, something like that? So this can be extremely helpful for making sure that your monitoring and evaluation system is, is capturing these beyond production impacts. Another method you could use is for when you do your surveys, you want to check your surveys and um, when you're when you're doing your your strategy, make sure your your data collection strategy for these surveys. Make sure that there's a strata for sex, so you're collecting data for both females and males. But also consider having a strata strata for producer type, or sorry, for actor type, as many different many projects will often just collect data from producers, not from other types of actors in the system that they're working in. For example, uh, veterinary service providers or extension agents, right? So making sure that we include, we have a strata for different actor types means that we'll be capturing data for actors that are working beyond production. Okay, so here we have a slide on where you can see one of our dashboards from our Phil Cafe project from USDA and. As Melissa just said, one of the findings from that landscape paper was that some of this data is often already in the database uh, for beyond production information, but they can't, it can't be found in the, the reports, it can't be found in your dashboards, but the project does have it. And I just wanted to say, you know, whoever you are in the project, you know, whatever your role, please ask for that data. Whenever you see you're know, reviewing that report, you don't see that sex desegregation or you don't understand exactly what those beyond production results were, you know, 
reach out to the m and &E team, say, can you please provide this information? And then you're more likely to get it because that data is often in the database. So, you know, the way to, to make this happen is just to ask for it. Another thing is if you're looking at dashboards such as this one, again, make sure that you have that sex disaggregation, but here you can also see that we have a beneficiary type disaggregation. And what's great about our dashboards at ACDI VOCA is that they are interactive. So if I click the, the female bar in, uh, the, in, in the sex disaggregation visual, it will filter the beneficiary type category by female. And this is fantastic. Of course, the same thing will happen if we click an age group. And this really pr promotes um, the project taking you know, that intentional look at what our achievements are for females and males in beyond production roles. And you can see here we've got producer as one of those beneficiary types, but we have um, other actors as well. Okay, great. So another recommendation is around these standard indicators that we have from USAID. Really appreciate the Feed the Future handbook that we have, the Feed the Future indicator handbook that we have, but a lot of the indicators in this handbook make it difficult for projects to include beyond production results just because the names of some of the indicators specifically have words like food security or agriculture. For example, uh, one of the finance indicators is uh, value of finance of agricultural-related financing access due to project assistance. And this discourages the capture of these beyond production results. And I would recommend, you know, as USAID goes and looks at this uh, Feed the Future handbook and goes into the, the next iteration, just to take that beyond production lens again and make sure that none of these indicators and their performance indicator reference sheets exclude capturing these beyond production impacts. The CLA approach. So I'm going to talk about collaboration, learning, and adapting approach. And this approach is extremely valuable for enhancing and promoting beyond production impacts for development projects. So this approach involves uh, the adoption of something called learning questions as well as internal indicators. Learning questions are basically questions that are answered to promote evidence-based project management. And learning questions are it can be answered in a number of different ways. It doesn't always have to include an intensive survey. It could also be just, you know, a couple of focus group discussions. It could be making some phone calls to a handful of different key informants. It, it, you know, it, it doesn't have to be expensive as long as that learning question is answered in a way where the project feels confident that they've gotten the information they need to close that information gap and, and better operate so that they can perform well. So a recommendation here is as you adopt this collaboration learning and adaptation approach, make sure that you have learning questions that are specific for, to beyond production activities and female empowerment. These such learning questions can, can absolutely help a project in, enhance, its, um, enhance its footprint in, in this area. And I'd like to give an example. You could have a learning question examining how a project could better engage females in beyond production roles. You could have a learning question that tracks uh, maybe risks or uh, negative consequences that could occur as, as a result of their particip participation in this, these beyond production roles. There's, you know, there are many different options and the landscape paper uh, include some other great examples on learning questions that could help inform a project's beyond production strategy. Uh, I'd also like to talk about these internal learning questions that, sorry, learning metrics that are a part of a CLA approach. Many projects, uh, you know, they, we have these donor-reported indicators, and donor-reported indicators require uh, setting a target and, of course, reporting our achievements of these indicators quarterly or annually to the donor. What's great about these internal learning metrics is that they don't 
require target setting, they don't require this type of reporting. It's about tracking data so that we can make sure that we are performing and achieving, performing well and achieving the results we want in beyond production and female economic empowerment. So, you know, in your collaboration learning and adaptation plan, this is a great place to adopt beyond production specific learning metrics are also called indicators. Sometimes these indicators are also called sentinel indicators or complexity aware indicators. Another core part of a CLA approach is something that's called pause and reflect. So we have all of this great information and data around beyond production, but it, it's so important to take the time and reflect on that information, Hope, facilitate a thematic discussion with your team, specifically around these the beyond production information that the project has and how it relates to females. And then in this in this conversation, talk about how the project to, can adapt to better achieve beyond production results. Uh, you know, we always talk about resourcing our M&E staff, resourcing our DSI staff, but I do want to repeat it here. If, if your M&E staff and GIS staff don't have the bandwidth or the time to collect that data, analyze that data, think and reflect upon that data, then we're never going to adapt and use that information to enhance project strategy uh, in achieving beyond production results. And, you know, I'd, I'd recommend making coll the collaboration learning and adaptation approach a part of the staff scope of work. I'd also recommend making sure, of course, that um, they have the skills, the, the capacity building opportunities to build those skills in data analysis, but also in CLA. And uh, Melissa mentioned uh, earlier that uh, in the in the paper, one of the findings was that the WIA, the women's uh, the women's economic uh, the the WIA index um, uh, is is actually really focused on uh, agricultural production and economic empowerment of women within the agricultural sector, and not so much beyond. Um, beyond production activities. So one of the recommendation, recommendations of the, the uh, paper is to use something that's called the value chains for WIA tool. And this is a great tool that's, that's one option that you can use to measure impacts for beyond production activities. But there are, there are other ways that you could go about this. And that's, you know, just using um, select domains from the WIA and mapping you know, custom indicators to those select domains so that you can you know, capture the results for women's economic empowerment in beyond production. And this is actually something that we're doing for our project in Myanmar, uh, the AFTA project. And it's really exciting and I think it's a, a, a great alternative strategy. Uh, another option would be to choose one of the many other gender um, the female economic empowerment frameworks that are out there. I have a, a couple here. You can see the IR, ICRW framework, got the CARE framework, there's one from Oxfam, and just mapping your indicators to these other types of frameworks as they're not specifically beyond production focus. And you can see here also I include the ACD IVOCA Gender First Monitoring and Evaluation framework and at ACDI Avoca, beginning of a project, you know, the GSI staff and ME staff, we sit down and we choose which uh, categories here are relevant to the project and we map donor reported and internal indicators as well as learning questions to those chosen categories and making sure that we're thinking about beyond production activities as we do this mapping can be super helpful in ensuring that a project has those beyond production specific indicators um, that we're often missing. Okay, great. And that's it for me. I'm going to throw this over to Jen for uh, answering some questions. Thank you. 
Great. Thank you, uh, Melissa and Jennifer, for a very comprehensive presentation. Um, we have a few questions that have come in on the chat, and I encourage you, if you have questions, to go ahead and enter them in the chat box so that we can make sure that we answer your questions. Um, the, the first question I'll, I'll go ahead and start with from, from what's come in is actually to check in with Melissa about that question about youth. Um, Fasina asked a question about the target group for youth. And if you could clarify um, what the, the actual engagement of youth was and, and how that, the findings were presented around youth and, um, and gender balance. So Fasina had asked if the target group was university students, um, was it missing a larger percentage of youth and possibly not accurate since the majority of youth involved in agriculture are not university students and graduates. So if you wouldn't mind clarifying a little bit more about the findings around gender and youth. Sure, thanks Jen, and thanks Fustina for that question. I should clarify, um, you know, the projects, the way projects engage with youth varied and it differed. So some projects did specifically target university students while others did work with a larger um, range of youth, including we did include one youth specific project in the research, which was the Advancing Youth in Tanzania project. And they worked with a wide range of youth that wasn't just university students. And so some of the activities that we saw from the projects did specifically target um, university students while others um, did include a larger number of, of youth or a broader range of youth. Um, but the internships um, opportunities that we saw were mostly focused around university or recent graduates. Um, that was just from the research, what we saw. It's not saying that it's representative of, of all projects. Um, obviously, there's much more activities that are going on. Great. Thank you. Um, so we also have a question uh, for Jennifer about data collection. And we talk a lot about the importance of disaggregation. Um, and we are definitely thinking about how to make sure we're disaggregating in various ways. Um, Jennifer, could you answer, Jen Peterson asked, what is a less binary approach to data disaggregation and data safeguards? Uh, and any experience or suggestions there? Sure, Jen. So we, we do include other, um, you know, sex, sex identification is you know, different than gender identity. So we include, you know, female, male, or other in case someone doesn't want to identify as either of those. And of course, we always give persons the option of not identifying. Um, so it's, it's, not, um, it's not required um, as, as uh, you know, an answer. Um, we haven't really included transgender as an option, if that's what you're, you're thinking about. Um, just because it can be a very sensitive topic and we, we want to be mindful of that when we collect data. That's very true. Um, but we do have a question from Judith, uh, and I apologize if I'm not pronouncing the last name correctly, Van Den Bogard, uh, who is asking, uh, please share some of your experience with intersectionality, which connects somewhat to collecting data um, beyond the gender binary, so thinking about additional data identification categories. Um, how do we reach and, and collect data around women with disability and, uh, and women and men experiencing specific stigmas or other types of marginalization? So Jennifer, I'll ask you to start, and then perhaps Melissa, you could expand on that. Yeah, so in our Colombia projects, we do um, ask persons to, if, you know, they have a disability. Again, it is a very sensitive topic. We also sometimes ask about LGBTQ identification. Uh, we 
We think that, um, you know, some people identify, but we do think it's a lower number than, you know, we actually are working with. And again, just because it is such a sensitive topic and we want to give people the option of, you know, not identifying um, in these countries where, you know, can it, there are stigmas associated with it and, uh, you know, just, just to be sensitive about our, our participants' needs. Yeah, and I would follow up. We didn't actually see any um, findings in the report that specifically mentioned um, the intersections of gender with other social categories such as disability or LGBTI. Um, but I do think there are, um, you know, that's something that we could collect better data on to capture if activities are working in this area. I do think there are probably many opportunities in beyond production um, for different um, groups or social groups or intersections to, to work, um, such as in processing or retailing. Um, but we unfortunately didn't find any information on, on that specific. Yes, thing. so currently the projects you were reviewing were not disaggregating in those ways, and that's something we would be excited to see going forward. And, yes. and Jennifer, uh, and, and also Melissa, um, could you speak a little bit more? Because a lot of times when we talk about degradation, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to expand on the questions that have been asked. We're actually um, first talking about individuals. Um, but a lot of times with Beyond Production, we need to go a bit further in thinking about the types of disaggregation um, in terms of the data to firms or organizations or other types of ways where we're separating out the data? Because I understand, Melissa, sometimes it was actually hard to trace impacts from the data you were looking at. So, um, so Melissa, would you talk a little bit about what you were finding and seeing in terms of where disaggregation was happening and, and where you were seeing gaps that need to be addressed? And, Perhaps Jennifer could follow on that with some suggestions of additional disaggregations that are useful in understanding beyond production results. Sure, thanks, Jen. Um, so what we saw um, around organizations or firm level disaggregations was that sometimes there would be disaggregation by like firm type if it was a civil society or civil society organization or private sector, um, and oftentimes by firm size, so small, medium, or large. But there were some cases where we found kind of, especially with firms, um, the ownership, the sex of the owner of the, of the firm. So that was helpful to disaggregate, but a lot of times it wasn't included in the disaggregation. So we could see the firm size, such as small, medium, or large, but we wouldn't know well, what percentage of those small firms are led by women um, or the medium firms or large firms. So that made it difficult to, to determine um, gendered impact in, in the beyond production sphere. Yeah, and you know, I, I think we've seen this in a lot of the older projects, but ACA Boca, and I mentioned in the presentation how important it is to have uh, that organization registry uh, with with the required you know fields for sex disaggregation for the organizations and we've created a standard organization registry form with kind of um, minimum required fields and that's one of those fields and when you have that it, it really you know that that form is connected to all the other outputs and outcomes for the organizations that we work with and that just allows us to dis sex disaggregate uh, those that data uh, as any way we want um, you know for that sex segregation and of course it's great to have like I mentioned that that type of organization as well so we can explore that a little further to see if they there is like a, a large beyond production role um, and yeah, so so I, I think having those standardized forms, looking at those fields is so important to make sure that the results that your the, of your ME system is sex disaggregated at the firm level. 
Great, thank you. That's very helpful to hear, very helpful feedback. Um, so Melissa mentioned in some of the, the findings um, that some of the projects had specific gender strategies or, or women's economic empowerment strategies in their beyond production activities and some did not. And there's a few questions that have come in about actual approaches. Um, Markendi DeSormo asked about developing projects in a manhood guided community where culturally and traditionally um, they're wondering what the best strategy is to support a gender balanced methodology. And um, I, Dipodi, I apologize if I haven't pronounced your name correctly, asked about how farming uh, may be done in the family but land may be registered in the name of a male member or a land. Um, that has been lent and asked about how to introduce a differentiator. So, um, Melissa, I'd like to ask what you saw in terms of, of strategies to address um, bringing women into and, and making sure that they have access to beyond production activities in those strategies, especially where we see um, those inequalities and those social norms, and anything around land um, that may have shown up if it did in the, the findings. Thanks, Jen. Um, so there were some strategy there were some strategies and activities that we saw that did engage men in support of women's activities in beyond production so specifically there was a project in bangladesh that sought to engage women as input retailers and what the project found was that they first needed to go into the community and conduct sensitization um, activities and meetings with the communities to build up um, men's support for women's participation in these activities. Um, there were other projects um, such as the one in Senegal that did use a, a champion strategy, a gender champion strategy that um, engaged men to support women's initiatives. So men's support and engagement is very crucial. A lot of times um, due to social norms that prohibit women from participating in activities, um, getting men's support um, for these activities is, is a crucial first step, as well as we don't want to cause any harm if women are introduced into new activities that could provoke backlash um, from the family. Regarding the second question around land, we didn't really find um, a lot of projects that were working on the issue of land ownership. Um, what I've seen outside of this is that you know projects do engage a lot of times with um, local community leaders or um, tribal leaders. Um, to allow women to access land, um, but I didn't. We didn't see any of that in in the findings per se. Okay, Jennifer, were you going to say something? Oh nope, nothing for me on that one. Thanks. Oh, oh but if okay. I mean for land, you can always just at the beginning when you again when you're profiling different participants. You know, ask them if um, you know they own the land, if if it's being rented, um, to kind of differentiate you know results for who you're working with. That's that's just one suggestion for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think we often think about access to land as a production level empowerment uh, issue, but it is also related to beyond production. So that that tracking is really important and reporting on the relationship and the progress related to it. I think will will be very informative going forward. Um, another topic, uh, Kathleen Charles in the chat raised an important point about uh, a theme that needs to be explored is, is how the role of women um, being empowered financially can help cement the value chain process needed to strengthen agricultural transformation. Um, and I was wondering, Melissa, if, if you could comment on what you saw in regards to access to finance 
and and some of uh, the not only the activities but also some of the reporting around that and perhaps Jennifer could follow up with some recommendations about how we report on finance in relation to beyond production Sure, thanks, Jen. I think um, there were a couple of issues that we found around reporting around access to finance. So, you know, in some projects that were strengthening women don't or agricultural um, businesses, for example, um, it was clear that the finance was being used for their for their business activities. Um, in other cases where the finance was more informal, such as um, through village savings and loans activities, it was hard to disaggregate whether the finance was being used for production versus beyond production. So oftentimes the indicator would say, well, this X number of women fin received financing, um, but we didn't clearly, we couldn't clearly tell um, in these cases if it was for production versus beyond production. There was one case of um, a project in Ghana that did an impact assessment, and they actually found that some of um, the funds from the savings groups, some of them were being used for production um, um, to access to buy seeds or inputs, while others were actually using the women uh, using the money to make household improvements or improvements that they wouldn't have been otherwise able to make without the finance, as well as um, some also finance their other income generating activities. So um, indicators can only tell us so much. And I think in this case, it was helpful to see that further kind of impact assessment that really looked in, um, at how finance was used. Cause that's, we oftentimes see, you know, the indicator of how much uh, finance was facilitated, but uses um, oftentimes varies on whether that's reported or not. Thanks, Melissa. Yeah, I I thought that was a really interesting finding in the in the paper that was mentioned specifically for finance not under not being able to distinguish between you know production versus beyond production financing, and it got me thinking about our own uh, M&E systems and databases, and you know we've started with you know ECD Avoca has a lot of market systems projects and. What we've done because we're working, you know, in di with different actors within these market systems is tagging uh, technologies and best practices to um, different types of activities, and this includes financing. So in our finance tracker table, we're tagging, um, you know, it, was this was this loan for, you know, improved seeds? Was it for to purchase fertilizer? And when we do this tagging, we know exactly what technology and practices are for production and what's for beyond production. So we actually could um, visualize this data, but someone would have to ask for it. And we wouldn't even think, you know, until I read this paper, I was like, oh, we could definitely, you know, show what, what financing is for production and what financing is for beyond production activities, you know, because of this tagging. But it didn't really occur to me that this was an important and that this is something that we should do until I read the paper. So uh, definitely something to think about. And, you know, if you wanted to go um, just a little bit simpler for every, you know, fin financial transaction, you could just, you know, click production, yes, you know, or no, or beyond production, yes, right? So. Just you could you could tailor your your database to collect this this information pretty easily. That's a really great insight. Sometimes once it's not until we do these studies that we realize that there's quite a simple way to improve the way we're uh, reporting on or analyzing the data. Like you mentioned very early on, we're often collecting this information. We just may not be looking at it from that perspective or that angle. So it's a good reminder to go back and look at whether we're asking these questions and, and are we working with our MEL teams to pull it out of the existing systems and then see whether we need to, to do a bit more to tweak how we're asking and what we're asking. I would so add, Jen, we questions. did... Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, we did, um, through the Kim Forma interviews, we did talk with many chiefs of parties and, and gender specialists who did actually report that same thing, where they 
had quite complex uh, monitoring and evaluation systems set up. And they said, you know, we could do these des disaggregations. It's just we haven't been asked to do them. So many projects do have this data, like we've said, and like Jennifer's um, given the examples of, it's just um, asking ourselves and, and providing it. Great. So hopefully in the process of doing the review, we prompted more, more reflection. And, and as we discuss it now, hopefully even further reflection and changes. And, and that goes back to that CLA approach of asking, are we, are we getting the information we need and, and what is that information showing us? Um, so great. So we've had, a, we've had several questions come in actually about um, time use as well as caretaking activities. Um, uh, Dick Tinsley as well as, um, I'm looking through, uh, Sonia David and a, and a few others have, have asked about um, whether there was any information in the projects looking at um, time use, caretaking, uh, potentially labor-saving interventions or domestic tasks. Um, so could you, Melissa, speak about whether that showed up in, in the analysis of information and approaches related to beyond production? Sure, thanks, Jen. We didn't see a lot of that come up. It was included as part of, you know, the gender analyses, but often wasn't necessarily addressed in the strategies. Um, I would say there was one project, which was the Advancing Youth Project in Tanzania, um, that says they are um, looking are taking steps to promote women's um, participation by establishing two child care centers um, to alleviate the burden for women, giving them opportunity to participate in, in beyond production activities. Um, I think I, uh, there's another report that AWE has produced on uh, women and youth empowerment and market systems development. And I know that in that report, they do touch more on care systems and how uh, market systems projects are engaging in care work. So it might be interesting to, to take a look at that report as well. Great. And, and I think that, um, that there was a question as well about how we will continue to think about the, the unpaid labor, the care work in relation to beyond production. Asla, did you want to comment on that? Sure, happy to, uh, Jen. Uh, just briefly, I think uh, more than anything, we now know the, the, sort of the, the burden of unpaid care and, and domestic work on, on women and girls in the context of COVID. And uh, I think uh, there's also emerging evidence that actually shows that in beyond production as well, unpaid care has been really listed as one of the main challenges for, for women entrepreneurs. Um, and, and in, in light of this, I think uh, what, what I would want us to think about is sort of the three R framework to recognize, reduce, and redistribute uh, unpaid care. And I think we are, uh, has been our main tool where we can understand men and women's workloads and how interventions are actually impacting those uh, workloads. And informed by that, uh, our, our uh, research through some of our innovation labs really focused on technologies that would reduce the drudgery and time burden of some of the activities that are mainly or typically done by women, such as harvesting and processing. So uh, the, that's, that's one way we are working uh, on, on sort of creating this uh, space for, for women to be able to direct their time to, to other activities, productive or even leisure, uh, that they they've, that can improve their well-being. And the other R is the redistribute, which is really uh, thinking more holistically as, as households and communities, what, what men, engaging men and changing norms around what's women's work and what's men's work, and having men as partners in, in 
in, in, in what is traditionally seen as, as women's roles in, in, in communities around nutrition, around child care, and so forth. So that, that's another sphere, especially in our nutrition uh, portfolio that's been really in the forefront of our, of our focus. That's Great. Legal continuing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so one of the questions that, that was asked is whether any of these projects looked at the way, and sorry, this comes from Rebecca uh, Wittenach Huber, um, did any of the projects look at the way uh, they interface with and improve capacity of local extension educators, officers, or agents? And, and how did the tools or approaches uh, presented support M&E and development of national services that are more gender equitable? So, so moving from looking at, at some of the, what the partners can do, implementers can do, but how those partnerships with local uh, organizations and resources can be strengthened. Did that show up, Melissa, in the, in the report or in the findings? Um, there were some examples, I believe. Most of what we saw were partners or were implementers um, working. Yes, they did work through, through project partners to provide training on gender um, and social inclusion to project partners um, to then carry out extension or, you know, TOTs to, to duplicate trainings. So there were some of those um, instances that we found in the reports, as well as um, you know, projects training their own staff and um, and and partners like producer networks or others um, on gender and social inclusion topics um, for further training. So there there was some of that that we found. Okay. And are there, are there recommended ways to report on those partnership development or, or the benefits of engaging with, with those local organizations, um, especially to support uh, Marceline Chimani asked how do national organizations integrate these approaches? Um, but I think we want to know more uh, how organizations can share out some of their engagement with those local organizations and then which are many of them connected into some of these national frameworks. What do we what do we think in terms of what we're seeing from the data? Or do we have more questions than answers at this point? Yeah. <laughs> I th I think there's probably more questions than answers at this point um, around that topic. And unfortunately, I think in a lot of this, there's more questions than we have answers to. Um, but yes, it, it, we didn't really see um, how these local partners connect to the national framework as much. Um, but I do think it is important that, you know, partners are sharing their, um, their engagement and activities, but also, you know, what are the results from these? So trainings are great, but what are the, what are the impacts that they're seeing? That was you know one of the big things is we weren't seeing any measurement around the results or the impacts from activities. And so I think you know whether it's local partners or at the national level, that is something very important that everybody needs to to consider. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. In a, in a couple of our projects, we take like a, a co-creation approach. We actually have you know, many M&E plans for these partners that we work with in, in building capacity, and we actually have them set um, sex disaggregated targets themselves for who they're going to work with and who they're going to reach, and we've tried to do, you know, in our market systems projects, um, making the business case for inclusion, and I think that kind of promotes some of this, you know, uh, um, inclusion, you know, at, at the local organizational level, um, and and I, I think that has really pushed, you know, some of this pause and reflect as well when we go back to these partners at the end of the year and look at what has been achieved and what hasn't and, and talk about future solutions. So Kristen O'Planik asked, 
do we get the sense in reviewing these activities whether attention to women and beyond production is increasing? Um, Melissa mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that, that our landscape analysis built on an earlier assessment of engagement and beyond production activities. And one of the reasons uh, engaged in this or was asked to engage in this is because we're very interested. We know that there's a lot of work to promote uh, gender equality and women's impairment at the production level, and we're still trying to make progress in moving beyond production. So Kristen noted that she's she's a little concerned that the primary way to, to target women is, is through training from the data that we're finding, and that the evidence is is still quite weak in terms of the impact of training and business outcomes. So um, based on the data, are we, are we seeing a, an increase in attention, even if we don't quite have what we want in terms of results? Yeah, it's hard to compare directly the, the findings from the, the 2016 report to this one. Um, we do see that there have been changes in where women are participating in beyond production activities. Um, marketing was the common, most common area in both reports. Um, however, you know, in the Leo report from 2016, post-harvest handling was, you know, a very popular area, while in this report it was actually the least common area. So we're seeing shifts in where women are participating in beyond production activities. We don't exactly know why those, those shifts are happening, um, but yes. Uh, um, so it's hard to say whether it's, it's increased, um, but uh, we, we are seeing, seeing shifts and, and differences um, between these, these two reports. And Kristen followed up with, with some, some further comments about there are mandates to, to target 50% women and, and concerns about driving programming to focus on women in production in order to achieve those numbers. So Kristen is asking if, if we think it will help to create space for implementers if Mel Pans plans could parse that out a bit more um, to have ambitious but realistic targets for different beyond production areas since achieving a 50% women participation target would be very difficult. And she also asked if there's more thoughts on how targeting as an issue should be handled to not actually create the wrong incentives for implementers. So um, I'll ask Melissa and Jennifer to respond to that. And then perhaps Asla, you'd like to weigh in after uh, they've commented based on what we're seeing. Melissa, do you want to start? Sure. Thanks, Jen. I do think, um, you know, when we talk about setting targets, because, you know, the country context, the local context are so different, um, we really recommend that you do the gender analysis first to see kind of where are women participating in beyond production areas? What are their roles? What are their opportunities and constraints to then set kind of targets that are realistic. Um, and so it may be, you know, women really aren't involved in processing in one area. And so it, you know it's going to take um, a lot more project effort and activity to get women involved in those areas. So you might set a lower target, for example, for that area, which could be adjusted as the project moves along. So I think it really comes down to doing the analysis and doing the research to set targets that are realistic and don't create perverse incentives um, in the market. I completely agree with Melissa. I, I think we have to be um, realistic, but you know, sometimes having a 35 percent, you know, participation rate or engagement rate is actually a huge win. If you know, originally there was like five percent females in, in that value chain that you're working in. So um, just just being uh, thoughtful and realistic is, is important. And speaking also to that, that previous comment about, you know, um, only tracking and engaging females in training, uh, I think it's really interesting just to take note that one of the um, primary standard USAID Feed the Future indicators that we've been working 
with um, has been percentage of female participants in USG assisted programs designed to increase access to productive economic resources, gender two. And that actually disallows us from counting uh, persons or females that only had training. They have to have some kind of access to finance, jobs, um, something, something more than training in order to be included in that percentage indicator. So take a look at what your projects are achieving in, in that indicator and it might give you some more insight on how we're engaging females. And I will just quickly add, and I, I absolutely agree that uh, I think a more granular understanding of, of where the opportunities are beyond production and being very intentional in in where we really support uh, efforts to, to, to work with women, uh, so not really tying ourselves to a specific target for every context and every segment of the market is, is critical. And I think one thing also is important that I think like programs like it are, as we know more about what are some of the you know layered approaches to get us there and get us there at scale in a, in a, in a, in a sort of a safe and sustainable way uh, will be important and I think we now know that that also really means thinking at a system level well, what are the, the in, in sort of enabling and complementary factors that would support a specific interventions to, to work and, 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 and support women in these roles. So uh, I, I think we can get there, but I think it will be a, it will be a process and it, it will definitely need uh, that sort of intentional thinking and, and data uh, and evidence-based. Uh, Absolutely. Program. And thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to, to further emphasize the, uh, the need to collect data, just as Melissa said, to better understand where those opportunities are beyond production and, and in the agriculture system. And I see that there's also a vigorous chat about uh, child care and unpaid labor. Um, and that Morgan shared a, a link to another AWE report, which complements this report, uh, the analysis of youth and women's engagement in market systems programming. I strongly recommend checking it out. Um, not only will it provide uh, exactly the things that Melissa, Jennifer, and, and also referring to, which is uh, you know examples and, and recommendations around really looking at the market system or the agriculture system to understand what is happening, where women are engaged and, and youth are engaged and where the gaps are, but also how to develop approaches. Um, as well as examples and case studies addressing some of the, uh, the ideas or the questions that people have asked about in the chat that unfortunately we will um, probably not be able to get to all of them today. Um, but, uh, but these are great questions. We appreciate uh, the examples of, of uh, or requests for lessons learned or, or, or promising practices. This report focuses less on the promising practices because there was less data to validate the impacts or results of the practices that we observed. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we're emphasizing the need for more and, and stronger data uh, systems so that we can better know if those trainings um, or those activities are resulting in increased engagement and empowerment. Um, and the, uh, the additional report will help supplement this learning with additional promising practices. Um, so we have another one more question. We'll take one more question, and, and then we're going to shift into saying a little bit more about the AWE program and, and it's what's coming next, which I think you'll be very excited about. Um, but uh, one question that came in was actually about um, where in, in the value chain or, or where in beyond production um, women were most engaged in. Uh, Fatuma uh, asked this question, and, and I think that that might be something for us to think about. Did we see patterns in terms of where you mentioned that we've, we've shifted approaches. Um, do we see p shifts and patterns in terms of how and where women are, are being accessed and engaged? Yeah, so most projects 
engaged women through business development services, which could obviously cover a range of kind of areas or um, activities in the value chain. Um, more specifically, looking at marketing was the most common kind of typical value chain or role that women were engaged in. Um, you know, access to finance was also popular as well as um, processing um, and, and inputs. So we did see women were, you know, obviously engaged in multiple, multiple roles and multiple areas of, of the value chain. Um, marketing, there wasn't a shift from 2016, um, but we did see that women were less engaged in post-harvest handling um, in this report. That was one of the lower areas where we saw women's engagement and beyond production. Great. And do you have any, any speculation as to why? We don't know exactly. I mean, yeah, it's hard to say. It could be because of donor preferences or it could be because of the projects that we looked at. So we only looked at 20 projects as part of the landscape analysis, whereas the previous analysis, I think, looked at 60 plus projects. So it was a much more scaled down version, um, which means, you know, it could have been due to selection bias or donor preferences. Um, you know, which influenced funding and project activities, um, kind of hard to tell. Um, at okay, time. great. So more to learn. Well, thank you everyone for such an engaged chat. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Asla, who can speak a little bit more about what's coming next for AWE and how anyone who's interested could engage. Thank you, Jen. And before I start, I would like to thank the team for this great, great uh, webinar as well and the presentations and a lively Q&A. Uh, so uh, before we close, uh, I wanted to sort of speak a little bit more about the ways I'll work with missions and partners in addition to the learning work streams that you saw an example of, and there are more to come on that as well. But uh, so other ways uh, all engages uh, with, with uh, colleagues in missions and across the field uh, include analysis and application support, which can take the sort of shape of gender analysis or other types of uh, studies and uh, to strengthen strategies, action plans, designs, or work plans uh, for, for, for activities. And, and so not the, just analysis, but also in, in supporting the findings being integrated effectively into these different uh, levels of, of uh, planning. Uh, the MAL support uh, can include engendering the MAL through support to custom gender sensitive indicators in MAL plans data reviews, gender integrated evaluations and research, and gender sensitive CLA workshops. Uh, capacity support includes blended virtual and face-to-face -face learning opportunities on understanding and applying core concepts in gender equality and women's empowerment, building missions and partners' capacity to prevent and respond to risks to gender-based violence, for example, in agricultural programming or other unintended consequences and training to design, implement, and manage gender analyses, assessments, and studies for ag topics. And finally, implementation support, for instance, to identify gender-specific risks and managing unintended consequences of interventions and scaling up promising practices. Uh, and just to give you a few examples, uh, all recently completed a gender and youth analysis for the Ghana mission uh, where uh, the, the exercise identified and prioritized behaviors that hinders women and youth engagement and empowerment in food security, agriculture, and nutrition sensitive programming specifically. And currently there is work underway to develop a gender-based violence toolkit, which will be focused specifically to agriculture and food systems programs. And this will be a sort of a second step of what uh, are recently completed, which was a compendium of uh, 
tools that are currently available from the ag sector as well as other sectors with applications in, in agriculture and uh, food system uh, sectors and, and segments. Uh, so this compendium will, is already out there and it has information on, on how each of these different tools can be applied, the resources and the capacity needed for their application in, in ag sector specifically, but we are taking it a level further and we are piloting this toolkit that will hopefully be very specific and, and targeted to, to the sectors that we are working in. So that's work in progress. And Oz monthly newsletters, uh, which you can sign up through the, the landing page that Oz uh, has on uh, AgriLinks, has a tool corner uh, uh, which lists different tools uh, that are uh, that are applicable or useful in, in, in uh, implementation, including, for example, digital finance tools, tools for scaling women's economic empowerment interventions, and so forth. So that's an um, ongoing uh, resource that uh, you can reach through the newsletter. And finally, uh, we have the upcoming work, more specifically the learning series for mission agriculture and market system staff. This uh, has been uh, in the works with, and is really developed and prioritized with respect to what topics and what approaches through consultations with missions. And that will be rolled out and fully uh, this spring into summer. And we have two learning streams that emerge from our beyond production uh, research landscape analysis that you just heard about. One is to look at tools and how to approaches to women, improving women's decision making in farm and farming and also in, in other within households but also in other uh, institutions across across uh, agriculture systems. Uh, we had a few questions about this in, in the chat during the presentation as well. So this is really building on a, a sort of mission consultation that happened early on in uh, in building out a portfolio for all that uh, while we are understanding that it is important to improve uh, women's decision making and this looks different in different contexts and different value chains, we really also need to have tools that can be integrated into programs and implementation. So this is what will come out of this particular learning stream. And similarly, uh, based on the finding that financial inclusion or access to finance is critical for women's empowerment beyond production, we are uh, working, or we're about to start work on, on uh, again, a set of practical tools and guidelines on how to uh, in, empower women to access to digital finance in agriculture. And this is going to include not only uh, different platforms or products that are available or that are promising for, for the sector, but also to understand what is what is needed in addition to this, uh, this sort of access to these uh, products and, and services for it to be really useful and transformative for, for women. So understanding that access to finance is necessary but often not sufficient for women to really be empowered uh, through, through this, um, these platforms. So those are coming up, just a few of the uh, activities that are is uh, uh, currently undertaking, and hopefully this is a, a great uh, step for for even closer collaboration with uh, you uh, on on various work streams that are is carrying on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Asla, and thank you to all of our presenters for your uh, wonderful presentations and deft answering of the questions today. Uh, we're bringing up some final closing polls and it would be helpful uh, our participants if you wouldn't mind filling these out before you leave. Thank you to all of our participants for your questions, uh, your introductions, your shared resources and comments. We really appreciate having your engagement in the chat box. I have some bittersweet news and that, that is that this is actually the final AgroLinks webinar on the Adobe Connect platform. We will be transferring next month to the BlueJeans platform and testing that out. We've um, We've had kind of a love-hate relationship with Adobe Connect over the years, but we will miss it. And we are also excited about experimenting with a new platform. So hopefully that will go well. 
Also, next month is AgriLink's 10 year anniversary. Uh, the platform and the webinar series have been going on for 10 years now. And we're so excited to have so many regulars coming back to our webinars and still attracting new people. We're very excited about this. So we hope that you will join for our special 10 year anniversary webinar at the end of April. I believe it is April 29th. So we are at time today and I'd just like to say one additional thank you to everyone for participating and we hope to see you at future AgriLinks webinars.